Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness, by Venkenpo Tsultram Jiamso Rinpoche, translated and arranged by Shenpen Hook M. Stage 2, Siddhamatra Approach While the Sravaka stage belongs to what is sometimes called the Hinayana, the Siddhamatra stage belongs to the Mahayana. Mahayana means the great vehicle because its goal is the great goal of the enlightenment of all beings. This contrasts with the goal of the Hinayana which is simply the cessation of one's own personal suffering. From the Mahayana point of view, the Hinayana is a true and valid means for removing the self-clinging that gives rise to the unhealthy emotions, klesa, the root of all suffering. The Mahayana also accepts that the Hinayana removes the veils of ignorance that prevent one realizing the true nature of the skandhas as not self, in other words as empty. However, the Mahayana teaches that Hinayana does not remove ignorance completely. It simply removes the gross ignorance that causes klesa and suffering. Technically it is said to remove simply the klesa veils, leaving the more subtle veils called knowledge veils. Klesa and suffering are extinguished like the flame of a candle whose wax is exhausted and the meditator passes into a state of peace which he calls nirvana. However, the Mahayanist realizes that even in this state of peace there is still a subtle kind of ignorance. It is ignorance of the true nature of reality and this ignorance obscures the fullness of the potential that a human being has. A human being can actually reach a state of perfect and complete awakening in which he is endowed with all the powers of a Buddha. This means all the powers that work for the benefit of all sentient creatures and bring them finally to perfect and complete awakening. Thus, the motive for progressing further is compassion for other beings and the wish to remove their suffering. Compassion alone is not enough, however, it is also necessary to have the vision to see that the power to liberate others arises from seeing the true nature of reality more deeply. One has to aspire to remove all one's subtle veils of ignorance and to realize the supreme awakening of the Buddha. These veils of ignorance are called the veils of knowledge and, though subtle, are very powerful. They pervade and distort the way one sees and understands the whole of one's experience and prevent one knowing anything properly in an absolute sense. Thus, the Bodhisattva has two great aspirations, one is to liberate all sentient beings and the other is to realize the profound emptiness of all phenomena, the realization of the fully awakened Buddha. This double aspiration is called the giving rise to the enlightened mind, Bodhisattva, Byangchub Semsbskide. With this aspiration as the foundation one proceeds to the next stage of the meditation on emptiness. Sittamatra means mind only or merely mind. As at the Sravaka stage, at the Sittamatra stage one thinks of one's mind as a stream of moments of consciousness with a knowing and a known aspect. However, whereas at the Sravaka stage one takes for granted a world out there beyond the senses, at the Sittamatra stage this is questioned. The Sittamatran does not take a solipsist view that the world is his own invention and that nothing exists outside himself. This would be like some kind of madness. He avoids solipsism because he already realizes the emptiness of self. There is no self that could be the creator of such a fantasy world. Essentially the Sittamatran approach, like any Buddhist approach, is based on direct experience. Following the Sravaka pattern of trying to be intimately aware of every moment of consciousness as it arises, at the Sittamatran stage the meditator realizes that the division of each moment of awareness into an inner perceiving mind and an outer perceived object is a conceptual invention. In a dream one experiences, moment by moment, inner perceiving moments of consciousness aware of seemingly outer perceived objects and yet, when one wakes up, one realizes there were no outer perceived objects other than the mind itself. Both the inner perceiving moments of consciousness and the outer perceived objects were different manifestations of mind. This shows that the mere appearance of seemingly outer perceived objects is not any proof that such things exist in absolute terms. In fact, there is no proof that there is any substance other than mind anywhere. Furthermore, the Buddha himself taught, the three realms of existence are merely mind. Thus, having already established that there is no personal self in the skandhas, the Sittamatran now looks at the skandhas themselves with greater precision. Not only is there no self in the sense of a lasting, separate independent person, 
but there is no difference in nature between mind and matter. Matter is empty of a separate independent nature. Thus, in absolute terms, each moment of experience is empty of a difference in nature of perceiver and perceived. Rather than regarding consciousness merely as the seeing or observing aspect of a moment of experience, it is also the content of that experience. Mind is, at one and the same time, both real and empty. It is real in the sense that all experience is basically a manifestation of mind. It is empty in the sense that it is not a lasting, single independent entity. It is instead a stream of fleeting, dependently arising moments of consciousness. Furthermore, all phenomena pertain either to the inner perceiving aspect of consciousness or to the outer perceived aspect of consciousness, in other words they are all mind. So the whole of existence is empty of a duality of substance between mind and matter. This means there are no limits to the power of the mind and there is no reason why a person should not realize the full powers of the Buddha's enlightenment and work for the liberation of all beings. On reflection, one can see that the sravaka approach is similar to removing suffering in a dream by recognizing that the person in the dream is not really oneself. The sittamatra approach is like removing the suffering by realizing that both the cause of the suffering, for example the fire or the tiger, and the person's suffering are both nothing more than the play of the mind. Realizing that, one realizes that the fire or the tiger and the one suffering are empty of any reality of their own. Furthermore, recognizing that it is the mind producing both, one could choose to dream of whatever one wanted to. Not only is one liberated from the illusion of self, one is liberated from the sense of powerlessness. That sense of powerlessness prevents one realizing one's true nature and limits one's capacity to feel compassion. It is important not to take the Sittamatra view to be a kind of solipsism. Sittamatra is not saying everything is oneself or one's own personal experience. There is a world that one shares with others. What Sittamatra is saying, however, is that it is not of a different substance to mind. This doctrine is very useful when discussing how a consciousness which is of a mental nature can perceive matter. There is a discontinuity between our experience and what we conceive of as the material world. For example we experience obstruction and conceive of solidity. We never really experience solidity as such. Solidity can only be imagined by the mind. Solid, material things cannot get into the mind and float about in it. Mind cannot put out a kind of feeler into the material world and experience it. The mind simply experiences mental events and interprets them to mean there is such a thing as a material world which it then proceeds to imagine. Quite a lot of modern scientists and philosophers think that the mind-slash-matter dichotomy can be resolved by saying that mind is none other than matter. The interesting thing about that theory is that not only does one interpret one's experience to mean that there is a material world beyond the senses, but that that material world can produce and experience thoughts, emotions, and mental images in just the same way that one's own mind does. Furthermore, these thoughts, feelings and images pertain to the material world. One is left wondering what material might mean in this context. The Dream Example the dream example is the best means one has for understanding the Sittamatra stage of realizing emptiness. In order to appreciate how pertinent this example is, ask yourself how you know that you are not dreaming right now. Maybe you feel like saying, because dreams are never so vivid as this, colors are not so bright, forms, sounds, smells, touch and tastes are not so clear and precise. However, Someone else might disagree and say his dreams are even more vivid than his daytime experiences. Does this then make his dreams waking experience and his waking a dream? Does it mean if your faculties become impaired so that you no longer experience things so clearly and precisely that your life becomes a dream? On further reflection you might suggest that you know that you are not dreaming because of the continuity of your life. Everything is in predictable places, there is a sense of cause and effect, regularity and established pattern of events and so on. You might say that dreams are not like that. They are unpredictable, they can change in bizarre ways without warning and for any apparent reason. 
there is no real continuity and you might find yourself in any place, time, shape, or form. Are you saying then, that if a dream were to stabilize so that there were a continuity and a fairly predictable pattern of events, if then it were to continue for long periods of time and your waking experiences were only to last for brief periods in which you were very confused and disorientated, then the dream would have become waking experience and the waking experience dream. For after all, it is not unusual for people to dream of ordinary situations, ego that they have got up and had their breakfast and gone to work and so on. You may laugh at the suggestion that you are dreaming now. You may think that if you were asleep and dreaming everybody would stop interacting with you. They would tell you when you woke up that you had been dreaming, so there is no way that one could confuse dreaming with waking. However, there is no inherent reason why you should not dream that people have woken you up and told you that you have just awakened from a dream. Finally one has to admit that there is no characteristic of waking experience that clearly distinguishes it from dreaming. It is only a matter of degree and of one's emotional predisposition. You believe you are awake because you want to feel secure and feel that the world is solid, real, and supportive around you. If you were to seriously doubt you were awake, you would feel frightened and confused. The stability of the experience of being awake reassures you, so you believe in it and give it a reality that you do not afford to dreams. If you suffer in a dream you are happy to let it go when it ends, feeling reassured that it was not real anyway. If you suffer in what you call your waking life, you get emotionally involved in it and afford it the status of absolute reality. Sittamatrans explain the phenomena of dreaming as the six consciousnesses which usually face outwards to the objects of the senses dissolving back into the base consciousness, a la Yonvijnana C section on Sittamatra doctrine below, like waves into an ocean. It then starts to move within itself creating images of subjects and objects that the mind takes to be real and experiences like waking experience. Thus, the Sittamatrans are not saying there is no difference at all between waking and dream experience. They are saying that the difference is not one of an essential difference in substance. The Subjective Nature of Time Maybe you are still not convinced. One knows one is awake because time is passing in a regular and predictable manner, so that one can synchronize events with an apparently stable and independent outside world. This is only another function of the stable way in which one's experience is unfolding. In fact subjectively time seems to be going fast or slow according to one's mood and situation. As for synchronizing, when events occur together they are automatically synchronized and if they do not, one thinks up a reason to explain it. If one cannot, one calls it a mystery and there have been plenty of unsolved mysteries in the history of mankind. There is a story about a man who went to a magician's home and was offered a cup of tea and he took a sip of it. What he did not know was that the magician had put a spell in the tea, so no sooner had he put his cup down than he was under the sway of a magical illusion. He took to his horse and rode to the end of the world where there was a great ocean so he could go no further. He met a beautiful woman whom he married and by whom he had three children. He lived with her happily for three years until, falling upon bad times, he was driven to despair and threw himself into the ocean. At that point the effect of the spell wore off and he found himself back at the magician's house with his tea still in front of him. So little time had passed that the tea had not stopped swirling in the cup after he had put it down. The point is that the impression of time passing and the apparent synchronicity of events does not prove that anything other than the mind itself is creating it. It is well known, for example that meditators can go into samadhi for hours or weeks at a time, but it does not seem to them that any time has passed at all. Absence of Consensus you may want to argue that there must be a world out there that is not mind or there would be no consensus about what the world was like. We tend to take as real whatever the general consensus of opinion dictates, especially when it coincides with our own experience and opinions. However, consensus is only a matter of degree. We have no means of knowing whether any of us ever sees or experiences anything in exactly the same way as anybody else. At the same time there is plenty of evidence that we do not see and experience the same thing in the same way. 
the difference is even more marked when one considers how differently different creatures experience the same thing. Take water for example we experience it as something refreshing to drink. We do not normally see it as something to live in. However, fish do. A fish's view on the nature of water is totally at odds with ours. Again, take the example of someone like Mao Zedong. To some he appeared as a dangerous enemy and to others a dear friend. Yet to a mosquito he appeared just as a source of nourishment and to the parasites in his body a complete universe. Since for any object its every aspect is established through the perception of the moments of consciousness perceiving it, how can its existence independent of these consciousnesses be established? Consensus does not prove anything other than that certain relationships exist between different streams of experience. It does not prove that there is anything other than mind in substance. In fact there are fundamental problems involved in positing the existence of some substance other than mind. How can such a substance be found or known? If something cannot be known without a knower, how can it ever be shown to exist independently? How does the interface between mind and matter actually work? How can matter enter into a relationship with mind, or mind with matter? Since the alternative explanation put forward by the Sittama Trins dispenses with such problems, it demands serious consideration. Sittamatra Doctrine In the Sittamatra school of Buddhism elaborate explanations are given of how the world appears as solid and real and out there, when in fact all that is occurring is transformations of a kind of mind stuff which is like an ocean giving rise to waves. The appearance of an inner perceiving and an outer perceived aspect in each moment of consciousness gives rise to the illusion that they are of different substance, mind, and matter. However, matter is just an imaginary concept. It does not exist at all. Mind is empty of such a distinction between itself and what is other to it. If the meditator were to rest his mind in its own nature and see this emptiness, then all confusion would disappear and the mind would be bright and clear and self-aware. This mind is called the self-illuminating, self-aware mind, Shis Parang Rigrangsil. It is called this because it is the mind experiencing itself, Rang Gis Rang My Ong's BA. As we shall see, the Madhyamikas do not accept such a mind and in their treatises they often refute the Sittama trends on this point. However, the Sittama trends reply that without such a mind there would be no way that one would be able to remember past events. The perceiver and perceived aspects of each moment of consciousness that has passed have gone. If nothing had experienced it and registered an impression, how could it ever be recalled? To explain the phenomena of memory and the registering of karmic traces the Sittama trends posit the self-illuminating, self-aware mind. According to the Sittama trends, a moment of consciousness does not just consist of a perceiving aspect and a perceived aspect, there is also the self-knowing, self-illuminating aspect. It is not a separate moment of consciousness, it is a necessary aspect of every moment of consciousness. For example when a flower is perceived, there is the perceived aspect, the flower, and the perceiving aspect that is focused on the flower. The former could be called the outward-facing aspect as opposed to the inner-facing aspect that experiences and registers both the perceiving and perceived aspects of the consciousness as a whole. It is inward-facing in the sense that it experiences the perceiving of the flower, registering both the flower and the consciousness but not distinguishing these as separate entities. The outward-facing aspect is like a television camera in that it films but does not register events. The interfacing aspect does register and can be recalled or reawakened as memory. Thus the self-knowing, self-illuminating awareness is an aspect of every moment of consciousness and is what enables the Alayaf Vijnana, see below, to carry the traces of past events, rather like a tape recorder registering sounds. When the right conditions arise they can be reactivated as it were. When a tape is replayed sounds are heard that correspond to the original sound and registered on the tape. Similarly one's karma ripens to one in a way that corresponds to the original action. Although this example is not analogous in many respects, it does illustrate the principle of the ripening or reawakening of dormant traces. According to the Sittamatra system, the mind that realizes there are no separate perceiver and perceived entities in a moment of consciousness is the wisdom mind nana. 
when this wisdom mind arises, there is no longer an appearance of such separate entities and so the base consciousness, Alayaf Vijnana, see below, is said to be purified. At this point only the self-illuminating, self-aware aspect of each moment of consciousness arises and these continue as a pure stream of radiant, clear moments of consciousness. Since the Sittamatrans were such great meditators and their ideas arose from their experience through meditation, they are often called Yogacarans, Yoga refers to meditation here. When the meditator rests his mind in its emptiness, free from dualistic concepts, he experiences the natural spaciousness and clarity of awareness. This is a profound meditation experience. Since the Sittamatra stage of meditation is based on this experience, their understanding of emptiness is very profound. They teach that the Alayaf Vijnana is the stream of consciousness that gives rise to all six kinds of sense consciousnesses and their objects, one form, two sound, three smell, four taste five, touch and six, mental objects. Alayaf Vijnana means the basis of all and it is called that because all that manifests does so on the basis of this stream of consciousness. Both the perceived and the perceiving aspect of each of the six consciousnesses are none other than the substance of the Alaya Vijnana. They are like the waves on an ocean. They are never other than the ocean, though they manifest differently. The Alaya Vijnana is what accounts for the continuity of consciousness through life, death and rebirth, deep sleep, dreaming and the meditative absorption of a yogi. The Alaya Vijnana is called the eighth consciousness. One may wonder whether every being has his own Alayaf Vijnana or whether there is only one. In the relative truth each individual has his own stream of Alayaf Vijnana and his own actions ripen to him. In the absolute truth there is only mind and it is empty of any separate perceivers and perceived objects. The seventh consciousness is called the Klesa mind. It is a mind consciousness, the sixth type of consciousness. It is the ignorant moment of consciousness that instantaneously follows a sense consciousness, causing the outer perceived and inner perceiving aspect to appear as separate entities. The first moment of sense consciousness is free from this ignorance, but it is so swift one is not aware of it and all one's conceptual notions follow on the basis of the following moment, the Klesa mind. By meditating on the emptiness of a difference in substance between the inner perceiving and outer perceived aspects of consciousness the Klesa mind is removed and the sense consciousnesses are purified. The Alaya Vijnana no longer produces the illusory dualistic appearance of separate perceiving and perceived entities and so the self-aware, self-illuminating aspect of each moment shines forth unobscured. The moments of consciousness, including both the perceiving and perceived aspect are called the dependent nature because they arise in dependence on causes and conditions, like reflections that appear in a mirror that only arise in dependence on the objects they reflect, they are conditioned by the past actions of the person whose stream they constitute. Remember that the person has no absolute reality. As in the Sravaka system, the person is relative truth. The absolute truth is the emptiness of those consciousnesses of separate independent entities of perceiver and perceived. The separate entities which we call mind and matter are simply inventions, in other words they are the imaginary nature. A very important element in Siddhamatran doctrine is the way it subtly divides experience into these three natures, one the imaginary nature, Parikulpita, Kunradag, two. The dependent nature, Paratantra, Xandbang, 3. The truly existent nature, Paranispanna, Yang's grub, the Sravakas had only distinguished two kinds of reality the relative reality of the world as we know it and the absolute reality of the skandhas not being self. The relative reality is like the dream experience and the absolute reality is that the person suffering in the dream is not really real. The Sittamatrans make a further distinction. The dream experience has a certain reality of its own because it is the mind, the dependent nature, that is to say the dream manifestations in themselves before one conceptualizes entities such as this is an enemy, this is a friend. The person in the dream imagined to be something separate from the things perceived in the dream is completely imaginary as are all the separate independent entities that seem to appear in it, these are the imaginary nature. The absolute truth is the emptiness of the mind of these entities, this is called the truly existent nature, 
because that emptiness is what truly is. Another example would be a film of a tiger or a snake. The concept of a real tiger or snake is the imaginary nature. The mere appearance of the tiger or snake i.e. the light playing on the screen in the form of a tiger or snake, is real and is the dependent nature. One could also think of the screen itself as the dependent nature, like the Alayaf Vijnana from which all the other manifestations appear. The emptiness of the mere appearances, in the sense of their merely being light empty of any real tigers or snakes, is the truly existing nature, the screen's emptiness of real tigers and snakes is also the truly existing nature. This example is not as good as the dream example though, because it gives the impression that the screen and the light playing on it are different substances. A better example for illustrating the relationship between the Alaya Vijnana and the other six consciousnesses is the ocean and the waves. The imaginary nature is never anything but empty. The Klesa mind produces the concept of a basic duality and from that all other names and concepts follow. These are simply names and concepts but none of the conceptualized entities they refer to exist. They are simply imaginary. The dependent nature is real existence, den par grub pa. The truly existing nature is absolute existence, don dam grub pa. The dependent nature includes all the six consciousnesses and their objects, the alayaf vijnana itself and the self-illuminating, self-aware stream of consciousness that remains when the alayavahana is purified. The self-aware and self-illuminating stream of consciousness is empty of perceived objects as different entities to the perceiving minds and so it is actually the ultimate dependent nature. The Sittamatrins called it a kind of absolute however, and this was what the Madhyamikas refuted, see stages 3, 4, and 5 on Madhyamaka. If you are wondering how the Sittamatrins classify phenomena into the relative and absolute truths, the answer is that in terms of that division or classification, the self-illuminating, self-aware mind is classified as absolute, Ranam Grang's Pai Don Dam. It is not classified as relative, Samvriti, Kunradzab. However, since it arises from causes and conditions it is not the ultimate absolute. The ultimate absolute, the Thug Pai Don Dam, is the truly existent nature. The truly existent nature does not come into the discussion of how the two truths are divided since it is beyond all such distinctions. It is simply ultimate pure and perfect reality, Yang Dag Pa. The imaginary nature is called imaginary because when one applies one's reason and examines the nature of these concepts clearly and dispassionately, one finds nothing real that corresponds to them. The dependent nature is said to be real because when one examines carefully one does find the self-illuminating, self-aware mind. The ultimate absolute is what is found in the ultimate analysis. In the ultimate analysis one finds no perceiving and perceived entities in the mind and this is the truly existent, perfect purity and ultimate reality. Sometimes Western commentators have called Siddhamatran and Yogacaran ideas idealism. This might lead one to think that in some forms of Buddhism there is the idea of a vast limitless mind that creates the world, like a kind of creator god and that beings are all linked to this one mind as god might be to his creatures. Ideas like these have long been current in India, but no Buddhist school ever subscribed to them. The Alaya Vijnana is not like a god, because it is a stream of momentary consciousnesses which are not a self nor a self. This is a fundamental difference between theistic and Buddhist systems and one should never lose sight of it. If one lost sight of this distinction, one could find oneself falling into the formless samadhis of limitless space, consciousness, or nothingness. Although there is no danger of getting stuck in such a samadhi unless one cultivated it over a very long time, nonetheless, one should be very aware of the fact that all Buddhist samadhis that lead to liberation are based on the realization of emptiness and not self. Samadhis that are not so based do not lead to liberation. Fruit of Sittamatra The fruit of the wisdom that sees the emptiness of the mind-slash-matter duality is the removal of suffering, Dukha. Just as dark cannot exist in the presence of light, suffering cannot exist in the presence of wisdom. The first ignorance is to take as a self what is not self and from this arises the concept of a difference between self and other. From this duality arises the mental disturbances, klesa, 
of attachment to what is dear and aversion to what is not dear, and through attachment and aversion the klesa and suffering increase. The wisdom that sees that mind is empty of a mind-slash-matter duality, i.e. empty of outer perceived entities different in substance to the inner perceiving consciousnesses, at a single stroke, cuts through attachment and aversion and all the associated suffering. On the most subtle level every moment of consciousness is purified of all stain of ignorance and there is not even the shadow of the idea of a difference in substance between mind and its objects. That means the mind rests free from all conceptual contrivance based on such dualistic ideas. Such ideas are based on false assertions and denials. Differences are asserted that do not exist and the true nature of reality is denied. All our concepts are based on accepting outer objects as separate from the inner perceiving mind and taking them to be real. By letting go of all these concepts through meditation on the mind's emptiness of this duality, the veils are cleared away and the light of the wisdom mind, the self-aware self-illuminator, is experienced. This is a very profound experience and even for those who experience it, it is difficult to explain. Sittamatrans try to explain it as a pure stream of self-aware moments of consciousness, but such an explanation falls into a logical contradiction, see later chapters for details. Because of this, more refined teachings on the nature of emptiness are required before one can realize the true nature of this self-aware, self-illuminating experience. Method of Examination Reflect on how one has no proof that the outer perceived aspect, or object, of a moment of consciousness exists independently of the inner perceiving aspect. An inner perceiving aspect of a moment of consciousness cannot arise without an outer perceived object, and vice versa. Each moment has to have both aspects simultaneously in order to arise. A perceiving consciousness with no object of perception is a contradiction in terms, as is an object of perception with no perceiving consciousness. One cannot arise before or after the other, having an independent separate existence, just as dream appearances cannot exist independently of the dreaming mind. Each moment of the dreaming mind arises together with its dream manifestation as its object. The dream manifestation cannot appear before or after its dream consciousness, nor vice versa. In waking life we deduce from certain patterns of relationships that objects of consciousness exist before and after we perceive them, but this is relative truth, Sangvriti Satya. When we examine closely we do not find any such existence in the ultimate analysis. Similarly evidence offered by others, who claim to perceive the same objects as we do, does not stand up to minute analysis. We can deduce that in the relative truth others perceive the same objects as we do, but ultimately every perception of both oneself and others arises and disappears simultaneously with its object. Both the outer perceived object and inner perceiving aspect of every moment of consciousness are of the same substance with no mind-slash-matter dichotomy, just as in dreams. Some people who think of themselves as scientifically minded, believe that the mind is the brain or a function of the brain and that for this reason there is no essential mind-slash-matter dichotomy. According to their view, everything can be explained in terms of the material world. They choose to overlook the qualities of mind that have no relation to matter, such as subjective experience, thoughts, and emotions. Although they would not take seriously the story of Pinocchio, where a simple piece of matter, a stick, inexplicably develops a mind experiencing hopes and fears, pleasures, and pain and so on, they would not find it strange if subatomic particles, atoms, or molecules started to produce thoughts and feelings. However, not only is there no scientific evidence whatever that such a phenomenon is possible but it represents a semantic confusion of categories. Linguistically there is the category mind and what is not mind i.e. matter. Matter, or the material world is what exists out there beyond the senses. If it does not exist independent of the senses, how can it be categorized as material? How can a material world that exists outside the senses also be the senses that sense and experience it? Such a theory does not answer anything. It does not even begin to address itself to the question of what conscious experience is, let alone to the question of what might or might not exist external to it. Meditation Procedure As with the Sravaka stage, 
begin by taking refuge and arousing bodhisattva motivation. Reflect carefully on the example of the dream and the three natures. Reflect on how the idea of separate truly existing outside objects is an unnecessary and superfluous invention of the mind. When you have become convinced of this, rest the mind as before in the spaciousness of that emptiness. The self-illuminating, self-aware mind rests in itself, focused on the emptiness of any mind-slash-matter dichotomy, Bzungjin Nias Gaius Stong Pa. The mind is taken as something given, so one does not focus on mind as such, one focuses on the emptiness of each moment of consciousness by not creating any concepts of there being a difference in substance between the inner perceiving aspect and outer perceived aspect. So, as in the Sravaka stage of meditation on emptiness, the mind rests in the vast expanse of emptiness. Between sessions reflect on how all experience is like a dream. The outer world and the inner mind are all mind, just as in a dream.